Good morning, everyone. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge getting here, no trains and such. Um, but anyway, um, thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks for the invitation here. Um, I'm also, I think Europeana is one of the co-hosts here, and I'm also on the board of Europeana um, since a short while. And I'm indeed happy to, like, if many people in the room know me, I know many, or I see many familiar faces, and it's great to see all of you here together. Anyway, I, um, I've, I've, I've indeed written a teaser, which I um, promised to do, and then found myself in a situation where I had to write it really quickly. And so I came up with this carrot and stick thing, which isn't really what my presentation is about. So maybe it's not a teaser. Anyway, um, what you see here is a picture is um, we were standing, Martin, who's sitting over there, and I and, and some others from Kensland were standing on the balcony, and we were talking about this keynote presentation on Wednesday afternoon. And um, we were looking inside, and this is the the view we had inside the office. Um, and uh, some of you will recognize this book, which comes out of a project which we've done in 2009 together with Wikimedia here in the Netherlands, um, which was called Wiki Loves Art, where we worked with about 30 museums and had people take pictures there and upload that material to the Commons, which resulted in this book. Um, this book, we printed a thousand of them, and I think we sold or distributed most of them, but there's about a hundred left in our office, and they've become like the go-to monitor stand in our office. So that's a fairly typical view. Here you see our devotion to um, the fusion of um, all things wiki and um, the, the cultural heritage sector, even when you look into our office. Um, if you still want one of these, like we should have brought some, but I think we've forgotten. But like, if you really want one of these, ask us. Um, anyway, um, what what I want to talk today is, and from my perspective, running Kennisland, being on the board of Creative Commons, being involved in Creative Commons for more than ten years now, so being neither really a Wikipedian nor being someone who works for a cultural heritage institution, so who who is at least in, embedded in an organization which is, um, which is tasked to, to care for a collection. So somewhere in between, but moving in this field for 10 years, I want to make an argument how um, these two communities, the Wikimedia community and uh, the, I tend to say cultural heritage institution, but here apparently you say glam, and I put glam everywhere in the presentation, but I probably say cultural heritage institutions. Anyway, so the glam community can work together to build a more lasting commons, and that's going to end up with an argument that I'm going to make how we, how we primarily need to join forces in reforming copyright law for the moment, and Dimi, who's sitting over there, and I will going to have a workshop right after this, how all of you can help us with reforming copyright law in Europe at the moment. Um, but um, similar questions are probably around the corner all over the world. Um, so that's what I want to get at. But I've structured the presentation in, in, in three parts. In the first part, I want to reflect a little bit on our work and on this relationship between the, the Wikimedia community and the glam or cultural heritage community. In the second part, I want to talk briefly about the concept of the public domain and how that um, is broader than this very precise description of something which is not in copyright because copyright has expired. And in the third part, I want to outline what's happening in the discussions about copyright policy in Europe, what's at stake there, and what we, I would argue, should all advocate for, should all fight for in the next years to come. Anyway, um, going back um, to, to, to Kennisland and what do we do at Kennisland. So Kennisland is active in this sector and has gotten into this, um, into, into this line of work, in, into the, the, the cultural heritage sector from our desire to, um, our overall mission is to, to create a smarter society. And for us, a very important part of that is providing as much access as possible to culture and information. And obviously, digital networks have opened enormous opportunities there. And um, so we've been, when working through a number of things um, on a copyright system that is fit for the digital age, and for us, that means one that maximizes access to culture and information. Maximizes not like 
don't respect the authors, don't respect the inherent rights, but really try to maximize like the room that can be given to access to culture and information where it doesn't hurt the interests of authors, creators, or other rights holders. And we are, we're, we're pushing and we're trying to, to, to widen these boundaries. Um, and we, we think we've, we've got a case for that anyway from our mission, but we've got a special case in sectors that work with public money. So the government, the educational sector, where we're doing a lot of things, but also the cultural heritage sector. And the cultural heritage sector is, of course, a little bit difficult here because the works are usually not produced with public resources. But we've got this system, like these institutions, which are funded with public resources, which maintain these works, which put enormous efforts into categorizing them, contextualizing them, digitizing them, um, making them available, maintaining the buildings where all this happens. So there's a lot of public investment in here, although the works often are not from owned in terms of copyright from, from the public sector. Um, so quick tour of what we've done um, uh, um, with, uh, uh, with the... Uh, in the culture heritage sector and related to activities where we've worked with the Wikimedia community. Our first project really was this Wiki Loves Art thing, and this is an image, one of my, my favorite morning work mornings, if I think back. So we managed, like, we, we signed up about 30 museums here in the Netherlands to allow people to photograph parts of their collection. And one of the museums we signed up was the um, Van Gogh Museum. And they were, like, they had this special thing. They said, it doesn't really make sense to have you in here, like, if, if all the visitors are there. If you've ever been there, it's quite full there all the time, basically. So they said, but we're going to open for half an hour before opening time. We're going to let you in, and we're going to let I think 25 people in. So we ended up with 25 people in this museum, plus 25 security guards, so more or less one security <laughs> guard. But um, you've, you've probably, very few of you will have seen the Van Gogh Museum this empty. And um, you can see there's people like who've not entirely taken this, this Vicky Loves Art thing seriously. There's someone lounging in the middle. There's someone without a camera which is our intern at the time, um, looking at pictures without taking photos. But there's also very serious people with tripods and stuff. Um, so that was our first thing where we thought, like, how can we combine the energies of the, or how we, can we use the Wikimedia community and the power of Wikipedia as something to, 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 to get a change in the cultural heritage sector, how they approach ownership of their collections going, which worked fairly well. Um, another thing, and that's actually, I think it's in that building, not in this building, but um, we've worked with the National Archive to um, make them, to, 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 to have them donate parts of their collections to the commons or release it under licenses where they then can go to the commons. This is something which happened in 2010, was hugely inspired by what Matthias Schindler and the German Wikipedia or Wikimedia folks did with the Bundesarchiv in, I think that was in 2008. Um, and um, we initially, like, there was a lot of hesitation here on, on behalf of the National Archives, so we worked with a collection of 1,000 images, which paled against the 100,000 images that the Bundesarchiv had given um, two years earlier. But um, this also resulted in a change of policy at the National Archive, and now they basically put everything under free licenses as long as they can. Um, they've just completed a large digitization project called Images for the Future, and as part of that, about half of the stuff they digitized is available under free licenses, um, which is a huge step. So it, for, for them, it really, we help them turn from a come to our website policy to a open data policy where they make as much as possible as much of their collections available um, for reuse as possible. Um, similar things we've done and, and, and maybe this is my favorite project and we've maybe pulled also hardest on this and I think there's a number of people in the room who've worked on this is open images or open build and how it's called in 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 Dutch um, which is like a fully open um, video platform for um, cultural heritage content which um, when I checked yesterday contains by now almost 5,000 freely licensed clips in um, in free video codecs, so it's fully reusable on Wikimedia, um, and um, it's growing 
at an ever faster increase. It's also one of these things, also the National Archive thing, which really opened the eyes of the institutions on the other side of this, because what they saw, like once they released this material, it travels onto other platforms, like the, um, the, the, the views and the, the use of that material increases many, many, many fold. So like these are um, for us platforms which we look at as platforms that we want to continue to grow, but they are also demonstrators to convince other institutions to open up their collections. Um, one other thing which is interesting, which we've done, we've put a lot of work in and we're still working in, is this platform out of copyright.eu, which is a bunch of co public domain calculators. What you're seeing here is flowcharts that have been assembled on the basis of the copyright laws of all the 28 EU member states to determine like where you, you use these flowcharts to make a determination if something is in the public domain or not. And this is like a small... Um, a, a small excerpt from that thing, all these flowcharts we managed to get in an almost readable size on a poster by one, from one by two meters. Um, you can download that. It takes a while on this internet connection to download that. It's really beautiful. Um, it, it is also fairly crazy if you think about it. If this is like the system which we use these days to allocate ownership in information goods, like if you have to understand this thing to figure out if something is owned or not. Fairly crazy system. Um, and finally, recently we've, we've, we've been working a lot with Europeana. Um, we've, we've helped Europeana develop their licensing framework, which on the one side ensures that everything Europeana publishes in terms of metadata is freely available under CC0. And on the other hand, everything that is available via Europeana, all the 40 plus million artifacts, carry a rights statement, a standardized rights statement. When we started this work, and this is labeled, unlabeled, most of the stuff on Europeana was just on there without any rights statement. That's like more than half of it didn't have a rights statement. It was just there, like here's an image or here's a book or whatever, and uh, figure out yourself what you can do with it. Um, and we've, we've helped Europeana develop a system of standardized rights statements. So they use 13 different ones at the moment. Um, among them, all the Creative Commons licenses and other legal tools. Um, and uh, we've worked tirelessly over the last two and a half years to get Europeana so far, or the data providers who provide material to Europeana, to label all of their works with a right statement. So now you can use on Europeana, you can filter the entire collection of Europeana on right status. That may sound like something which is a little bit uh, not so much a not such an achievement if you're very active on the Wikimedia Commons where like not having a right statement is probably like the thing that kicks you, gets you kicked off fastest. Um, but it has been an enormous operation to, to, to get these institutions to understand that in order for others to have, to, 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 to get any value other than looking at something from it, it needs to have a right statement, unfortunately, these days. So you need to positively identify if you want to show someone that they can use it, you need to label it for that. And that's something like we've spent a lot of time recently, and I think like having projects like Wikipedia, like who who lead by example there, is has been like a, a large contribution to making that possible for us and it's something like we're slowly seeing a change here in the in the cultural heritage sector we're working on this currently we're working to expand this to a worldwide system where we're working with the digital library of america where we're trying to get them to adapt a a similar system or joint system where um, where we, we try to establish this principle that you need to apply standardized rights labels to cultural heritage objects that are published online um, wherever you publish them. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, um, getting back to the carrot and the stick. Um, so I've hinted to that in, 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 in parts of these examples. So. Wiki, from, from our perspective, the, the Wikimedia community or Wikipedia has, in all of these discussions that we had served in, that we had with cultural heritage institutions in the past, has served us in two roles, as a carrot or as a stick. Um, and as a carrot, um, we've, we've, we've managed via some of these smaller experiments to demonstrate really that sharing collections via Wikimedia dramatically increases the reach and impact of GLAMs. And they are struggling, what do we do um, online? How can we increase our impact? There's an open question still, how can we measure the impact? 
But the number one argument which, um, which, which has worked in, 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 in letting them make their materials available online in high resolutions and under open licenses is that once you get your stuff on Wikipedia, like, like, like a manifold of the people who used to look at that stuff on your own websites will start to look at the stuff. In the beginning, very many people were, accepting, were, were expecting that to, that to actually translate into traffic back to the websites of the cultural heritage institutions. That isn't really the case. Like it turns out that like having a, 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 a reference link at the bottom of a Wikipedia article is a much better indicator of gen generating traffic back to a website. But still, um, the, the, we're seeing also a change of mindset here where people say like we're in the business of making this available to the public and if the public doesn't come to our website we're happy having that on other websites other web platforms that it's seen like we've preserved it we don't care where it's looked at and I think this is a a, a very strong argument for 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 pushing um, for for pushing cultural heritage institutions in investing in digitizing their stuff and in making it available because in many cases um, especially for the smaller ones it's very very difficult to attract sizable amounts of people to their own websites um, there's another um, use and that's kind of like the opposite um, as the stick um, Wikimedia as a stick um, we've we've argued in many cases in this discussion where it is about like should you make stuff available online under open conditions there's a lot of hesitation and um, we've I've, I've run many many sessions with cultural heritage institutions which were called risks and rewards sessions where you go and and and, and try to list on one side like the 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 rewards of publishing something openly and on the other side the risks and um, the risks is basically all about loss of control and one of the 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 the, the other or which doesn't really fit into this risk-reward thing, but it's a reverse thing of the risk-reward thing, is that there's one big risk that they are concerned about, and they know about it. They are very, very risk-averse in saying, like, if we go online, all kinds of crazy stuff may happen, and we will, like, people will take away our stuff and we'll place it next to porn, and I don't know what you all uh, uh, hear here in this context. But the one thing which makes people thinking is, um, there's another risk. If you don't go online, people will not come. Like People will not come to your institutions. You will become less relevant. People will simply find other sources for accessing culture and heritage online, and you need to be online. And there, Wikipedia is really like the, the, the thing which also, again, grasps people's imagination, where you go and say, like, if, if, if you want to lose out to something like Wikipedia, if you want to prevent that Wikipedia is the sole access point, the sole source of where people get all their information about their history, about their culture, then you need to be active online, you need to be active alongside Wikipedia, and you need to contribute to that, because otherwise you're out of the picture. If people do not find you online, people will not come to your institutions as, um, as much as they used to be, and... Uh, so you will lose out. So Wikipedia is also like a little bit like that scary thing which does many things better. Um, and I, I, I didn't really manage, um, manage to find a good title for this slide, but this, th there's one other interesting thing about what Wikipedia, and from my personal experience, caring about copyright a lot, like the scary thing where Wikipedia does one thing much better than many cultural heritage institutions is really in the field of copyright. And I'm not talking about, le about like the, the, the gazillions of different right statements that you people have on the comments, like the, the hundreds of different public domain statements. Like I think that's actually, for, for most people, that's fairly confusing. And I believe that this system of standardizing and trying to bring that down to a more manageable thing is actually pretty um, is a is a approach which has a lot of merits on itself. If you think about reusers out of a relatively sophisticated, like outside of the relatively sophisticated Wikipedia community, um, but the other thing that Wikipedia does much better is defending the public domain, and um, there's there's no better better example than 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 the Museo Thyssen in in Madrid. 
that um, has recently started contributing to Europeana, and we had long discussions ahead of that about a number of things. And if you if you go on the website of the the, the Thyssen Museum, like you find um, relatively high resolution things of um, or or digital assets of of images of paintings that they have in their collection. And um, if you so so you click on this, make this bigger, and you go down, and I don't know if it's readable. You can they 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 first of all they claim copyright on this thing from 1600 somewhere, like which should be slightly, um, which is slightly difficult to explain. Um, the second thing is like they they allow you to download it in 72 pp uh, ppp uh, whatever ppp means by the way. Um, the third interesting thing is like. You, you have to read and accept these conditions, at least that's what this tick, spo tick box applies. Like if you go to that website and you just download it without clicking on the tick box, you can download it anyway. So <laughs> apparently like which, which, which I would take and I, I guess many other people have taken as like you can also not read and not accept the conditions, download anyway, so you're not bound by these conditions, right? Like that's... <laughs> Difficult thing. If you download it, um, then you get a 72 thing. And now, if you if 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 you go around a little bit, and you need to look at the the URL up on the line, um, you just replace descarga, which is which probably means something like download in Spanish by grande, which means big, in the URL, and you get a much bigger version of that thing. <laughs> so, um, but still, they claim copyright on this, right? Like it's not like the um, the, the most foolproof system, I would say. Um, obviously, you can find the same painting on Wikimedia Commons, um, where it is noted to be in the public domain because it's um, in the public domain in the country of origin and other countries that have a copyright term of a hundred year or a life of the author plus a hundred years, which is I, I don't think there are countries with a longer copyright term in the world. Um, it's also in the copyright in the United States. And there is this reference to the position taken by Wikimedia, which says um, that faithful reproductions of two-dimensional pub uh, two public domain works are also in the public domain, kind of like dealing with the question if rights arise during digitization, if the person who made the photo or the scan of that thing has any rights. Um, it does, however, have a link down there, reuse of PD for art photograph, uh, uh, photographs for details. And if you, um, oh, and um, now there's a mix-up in our slides. Just, just to point this out, the two images on Wikipedia and on, um, on, or on Wikimedia Commons and on the museum website are exactly the same. They have the same hash. They are the same, which probably means that the one um, on Wikimedia was taken via that way I just illustrated from the website of the museum. I doubt it's the other way around. May happen in the future that museums take their stuff from Wikimedia, but it hasn't happened yet. Right? Um, so we, we, we have the exact same image here, um, like, like, to the, like the exact same file of the image, and like we have these two totally different copyright statements on there. Hey, now the the, the sad thing is, if you click on that link of the, the public domain of, 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 of artworks link, you get the explanation and you go to Spain and you see that it's okay if the, the, the photograph was taken before 1990 and it's not okay, meaning like there may be rights in the, or there are rights in the reproduction of the thing if it's taken after 1990. And of course, like images of that quality are taken after 1990. In 1990, you could make by, I don't know, like 100 by 100 pixels uh, digital resolution images, but not much more. So it has been taken after 1990. Now, this is kind of frustrating because um, I have been actually in this discussion about the Thyssen thing. Um, I sat in a room with a number of high-ranking European Commission officials, and they pointed me to this website saying why Europeana's position saying this should be in the public domain is wrong. Like, they point us to Wikipedia guidelines, and, and we weren't aware, or at least I wasn't aware of that. Like, I hadn't done my proper research. They had done on Wikipedia, and they go, this is the very reason, also on Wikipedia or also on Wikimedia Commons, why the Spaniards can claim copyright over that. Because on that picture back here where they claim copyright, they are not claiming copyright in the image, they are claiming copyright in the reproduction. And that's fine under Spanish law. So this is one of the things where Wikipedia, where we are like, where 
Well, I have a very, very difficult relationship with Wikipedia because I admire this kind of thoroughness. I admire this sticking to the rules. Um, and I, I can also admire the cunningness of basically them playing the jurisdiction game where you say like, okay, but like we're hosting this stuff in the, in the United States so we don't care about that stupid Spanish law. Um, but all of this also has the effect at the moment that, um, that, that, that in Spain we have a, a museum which still can claim rightfully so that um, they have not necessarily copyright over this image, which this implies, but they have exclusive rights over the digital reproduction and can do with it whatever they want. So they claim copyright and they apply um, somewhat nonsensical um, terms and conditions or like easily evadable terms of conditions to it. Um, so, so there is, and I, and I think there is a, this points to a big problem. Like we're running into this thing that, that we need to redefine what the public domain is here. Like, and how we, what, what are the actual contours of the public domain, and can we find something that is workable for the Wikimedia community, that is workable for the, um, the cultural heritage community, and that is a very splintered community because they have to deal with all these different country rules. That's a nightmare in Europe already, and it's a bigger nightmare worldwide, I guess. So, um, let's get further to the public domain, and I've um, chosen to illustrate the public domain by this sleeping cow, because um, if you Google for images of the public domain, you only get back images which have a public domain status, but not like images of the public domain, because the public domain is also a fairly abstract concept, which is very difficult to, um, to, to give an image of. Um, but this is a cow sleeping on an alm in Switzerland. Um, I don't know if people are um, familiar with this concept of an alm, but it's the, the, the kind of like agricult agricultural commons, like where it's like um, basically um, land up in the mountains where like entire, entire villages drive up their cows and it's not owned by anyone, it's owned by the community at large and they have like fairly elaborate rules about like who can send how many cows up there but it's it's not owned. So for me like this 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 cow sleeping on the grass in broad, broad daylight is maybe like was at least yesterday night the best image of the public domain that I could find. Um, yeah, it's called a, co a co yeah a commons, right? Um, and so it's not exactly the public domain because there is like there there is rules which keep outsiders out of it, and the public domain obviously, like in its strictest form, doesn't have rules around uh, keeping keeping outsiders out of it. Um, but it's at least I, I still find it the best picture of the public domain that I could find. Um, so if we're looking at the public domain and um, the public domain really is, if you look in terms from copyright, and that's a fairly, fairly odd perspective, but probably the right perspective, the public domain is the rule. Everything is in the public domain unless it is in copyright, right? Like there's certain parts of our cultural protection, of our cultural production are protected by copyright. Um, there's requirements for obtaining copyright protection, namely sufficient originality and it needs to be produced by like a human being and not a monkey and things like that. Um, but, and it's temporary. It lasts, um, from a human perspective, it lasts very long, but from like a perspective of a culture, it, use, it, 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 it lasts relatively short, like about 200 years or something, and then something comes back into, into the public domain. So we have this strict thing which is taken out of the public domain, that white dot there, which is like the stuff protected by copyright. Unfortunately, I think in this sector that we're dealing with, and if we're also looking at cultural production over the last years, which is rapidly ramping up, um, it's probably most of our cultural production um, works, cultural artifacts that have been produced by mankind ever are currently protected by copyright because like, we're producing so many often useless things these days, but like it's, it's, it's increasing rapidly. And there's a lot of very interesting thing, I think like if you are from, either you're from the Wikimedia community or from, from the glam sector, I think like a lot of the interesting part stuff is our relatively recent past because that so much defines who we are as societies at the moment. So I think there's an above average interest in that stuff which is blocked away by copyright at the moment. So fortunately, there is um, a couple of things in between the public domain and the, 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 the strict copyright protection. So the first is what we 
call what you can call user prerogative. So this is the 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 kind of like space around copyright or the 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 soft fringe of copyright, if you will, where there is things like limitations and exceptions or fair use that grant users the right to do something with stuff without permission of the copyright holder. And this is something that cultural heritage institutions rely a lot on currently when they do their um, when they do their internal work in digitizing or when they make stuff available on the premises and I'm going to get back to that but this is generally like where you where, 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 where copyright laws tend to balance the interests of copyright holders that are still active that are managing their copyrights that for works that are still in copyright and the interests of society as a whole <coughs> which has in which which has an interest in in getting access to material that is under copyright protection, and then we have and that's fairly new the voluntary commons, which is basically what um, free software licenses and Creative Commons have established this way to give away your rights sometimes under conditions sometimes unconditionally to allow others to work with this is where it really like the the, the boundaries between the public domain and what's in copyright between the commons become a little bit unclear so we have these things and this is the voluntary commons I think is something without this like there wouldn't be like a Wikimedia commons at the moment or the Wikimedia commons would only contain stuff which is basically more than 150 years old which is the situation and which um, so this voluntary commons is a very important thing for 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 constructing a commons as well and I think that is something that the Wikimedia community is focused on anyway, uh, quite a lot but I would urge you and I think that is where we can work together like to also look at this and see like there's this space that is created by limitations and exceptions which doesn't create a copyright status that is okay for adding it to the Wikimedia Commons, but which still increases access to culture and knowledge to, to, to take that into your definition of a commons, which is important to add or which is important to preserve in order so that your partners in the, in the glam sector can go ahead and um, can make their contribution to like increasing the commons because this is the primary mechanism they rely on. Um, so to summarize that, glam, glams need the space created by exceptions and limitations to make their contribution to the commons. And on the other hand, and that goes a little bit back to that example I had before from the Museo Thyssen, at the same time, they must not abuse their position to claim exclusivity over public domain works. I see a bit of hypocrisy there once in a while where like Lambs complain about like copyright as long as it's held by others and as soon as something ends up in the public domain they start inventing their own rules why they don't have to make that public as well. And I think like if we want to if we want to broaden their space and if they want to win this argument that they are doing this for the public and that they deserve more space in the field of limitations and exceptions to copyright, then they better get their act together and also operate as credible guardians of the public domain in its in its in the in the central sense of like the stuff where copyright expiration has expired so what do we need then we need copyright reform as a result of all of this and that is mainly copyright reform when we talk about this this is not about changing copyright altogether abolishing copyright or saying um, doing stuff where reform can happen is mainly in this space of exceptions and limitations um, it's 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 fairly unimaginable that we could abolish copyright or say that people could have like that we turn around principles of copyright say something is um, something is copyright protected only if an author claims about it so the battle about reforming copyright is very much in this in this sliver around copyright where it's limitations and exceptions where the the law tries to balance the interests of the author limits that in some points in order to make other things which are in the interest of society as large possible um, so and from the glam sector, like this is a, a fairly unique opportunity at the moment. The current 
copyright rules in most parts of the world come from around like the change of the millennium. The European copyright rules are from 2001. The American Digital Copyright Millennium Copyright Act is from a little bit before that. But that's the last time like we've really like or where, where, where like digital has been introduced into copyright laws and considerations coming to, to digital. Um, I think in 2000, like none of us were probably or very few of us were active in this field. So we're like now for the last 10 years, maybe the last five years, we're really realizing that we're in one of the most dramatic transformations in terms of how we access cultural heritage and culture here. Um, and that is like that you can be fairly certain that almost everything will be digital. We're digitizing everything. What's not digital right now will be digital at some point. People have realized that and people start to think about how can we redefine like what we've done in an environment where maybe digital is more important than the analog preservation of things. That, is, that has impact on, on, on many, many aspects of running a cultural heritage institution, but like, it is also a lot of, it runs into conflicts with copyright law fairly quickly because like digital makes it much easier to provide access. Um, unfortunately, the copyright rules are not really um, um, tailored to that. Um, so the current copyright system has not been designed for this transformation and GLAMs and citizens deserve much better here. And I'm going to run through a number of examples where we run better. And I think Dimi and I will, in the workshop afterwards, will we'll go into detail. We'll explain what that means. But like, we'll also try to work with you and see how you can help with changing this stuff. So first of all, cultural heritage institutions, there's this one thing which was done for cultural heritage institutions two years ago, the Orphan Works Directive, which is a joke. Like you basically need to spend hours and hours for a single work to figure out that there is no one when you know that before at which point you get the right to make it available on your own website and if somebody shows up afterwards like they can still like um, demand royalties for past users. Like this is, this doesn't work for mass digitization projects period. It may work if you're a cultural heritage institution and you need like a poster and you can't identify the, for an exhibition and you can't identify the copyright holder in that object that you want to put on that poster. But if you're talking about hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions of objects, think the photo collections of the National Archive here next door, like this simply doesn't work because it's too expensive. Um, it's just not worth the time even in sheer mind-numbing work that needs to be done, and it doesn't produce any useful results anyway. Further, copyright, like cultural heritage institutions deserve a copyright directive or a copyright system that allows GLAMs to digitize, or they deserve something which is better than the current copyright directive, which allows GLAMs to digitize works only in certain special cases. Like this is, in, in the Netherlands, this has to be transposed, it must be a preservation copy, so it must be like there must be some danger to the underlying work and then you can digitize it. I can't imagine a single situation where like someone, some copyright holder actually incurs damage by like this library or this archive or whatever museum digitizing the work and keeping that in their collection, making it more accessible internally, making it more manageable. Still, like the European copyright rules and copyright rules in other countries basically say, you must not make copies of these things because making copies is a bad thing. And I think cultural heritage institutions deserve better here. Cultural heritage institutions also deserve better then a copyright directive which allows these institutions to make stuff available on dedicated terminals on their premises. So you can go to the National Archive and you can browse through the entire collections, but only on their terminal. You can't do that on your own iPad, which you bring in there, which would be against the law. And you can't also do that from another location than from the National Archives, which is fairly silly All in, if, you, if you compare that, how we access information in general. So we deserve something much better. Um, I think one of the core demands from the cultural heritage community is they need to, get, need to get the right to make stuff available that is not made available by anyone else. If no one else makes it available, they should be able to make it available, period. Um, we deserve better than um, under the current copyright directive the optional freedom of panorama exceptions that limit citizens in many EU member states from documenting public space. So in some member states, like in the Netherlands, it's perfectly legal to take pictures of 
buildings that are protected by copyright or artworks that are protected by copyright in the public space. And in others, it's not. And in some, it's only allowed for non-commercial purposes. And in some, it's allowed within, outside of buildings, but not inside buildings, which is a mess which results in, um, in, in, in some member states, you can actually publish a picture of the atomium in, uh, on Wikipedia and others you can't. This is not only something which is relevant for the Wikimedia community or for, for, for like your projects, it's also something, it makes it for example in some member states much easier to film films, like feature films. Like in Amsterdam you can just go around and like you need to have your, your, your actors in the street but you don't need to clear like the rights in artworks which may be in the background of your film. In a country like France, you have to clear the rights of artworks which are in the background of a film. That means like, that film production is much more expensive in, 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 in France, at least for that reason, than it is in the Netherlands. And that is something like here it becomes maybe also clear that this is not only a, 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 a question between like the public versus the creators, it's in many cases these exceptions and limitations also benefit the creators again. It's easier to create new stuff if you have freer access to old stuff. That's the same with online accessibility of archive works. Many books have started by people sitting in archives and writing stuff. So this is not us versus the creators in this field, um, but this is something finding more sensible things which are more in line with modern practices. And finally, we also need <coughs> better than a public sector information directive that contains all kinds of loopholes that keep public sector documents out of the public domain. Um, the public sector information directive has been uh, published two years ago with the intention of making public documents in the EU easier accessible. It's such a convoluted thing. It applies kind of to cultural heritage institutions that a lot of people are simply confused and it it refuses to make clear rules which should be, like we have in the US, that stuff that is produced with public money or with federal money in the US, not public money, but by the federal government, so which stuff that is produced by governments should be freely available to the people. Fairly easy, fairly logical principle, like in Europe, we've got a mess on that again. So all of these, and, and I've, I've been it out of copyright before, but like that can't be said. We also deserve better than, a copyright, than, than copyright rules that make it extremely hard to figure out if a work is in the public domain or not, and that then allow all kinds of people to apply other exclusive rights to something just because they have digitized it. So it would be nice if we actually had copyright rules in the, in the, in the European Union that are um, easy to understand. It will never be really easy. You need to figure out when someone died or something. But we are far, far away from the principle saying like copyright expires 70 years. Like if you figure out when the author died and you can count to 70, then you know when something is in the public domain. Um, which is something that, that, that the current EU lawmakers generally consider that that part harmonized. So they think this problem is solved. Like, um, it's a bit of a irony. So in short, Europe needs a copyright system that enables universal online access to culture and allows us to build a lasting commons together. And there's a couple of tweaks to the copyright rules which Dimi and I will talk about in the next workshop. Um, and I want to spend my last minute or so just outlining where we are in the European process. So this is the new EU Commission under, under Juncker and their objective, or one of their objectives, is not their only objective, they also want to save the euro and some other things, but their objective is to modify copyright rules to reflect new technologies and make them simpler and clearer. That's actually part of their second objective, so it's fairly high on the political agenda. Um, if you work on it on a day-to-day -day basis, you get the impression that they've they, they, they'd rather do other things first, maybe, but still, like, it is um, as high on the political agenda as it hasn't been for at least 15 years to reform copyright. So there is a unique opportunity in Europe. Um, so the European Commission, and this is the building where all the people that stood on the lawn there actually work in, is expected to come up with a proposal for new copyright rules after the summer, whatever that means. Like that's a fairly open-ended thing, but um, it's it's going to be after the summer, and it's probably going to be some kind of like modification of the existing EU copyright rules, although nobody knows for sure. Um, 
In the meanwhile, um, Europe is a, has a big um, a, a political system. We have the European Parliament, and because they don't want to wait till after the summer, the European Parliament is working on an own initiative report on the implementation of the 2001 Copyright Directive. Now, an own initiative report is something where they go look at the thing and think, here are things that are wrong that could be done better. Um, it's completely non-binding, so they can say whatever they want, and then that uh, own initiative report can basically, it doesn't, it will never lead to a change in the law, but it's nevertheless very important because it is an extremely contentious topic there, and like, you will see the contours of what this own initiative report will contain, will give everybody else a good indication of what types of change are possible and what type of change are not possible. So it's extremely important, and Dimi is doing a lot of work on that, I'm doing a lot of work on that, to try to influence that this own initiative report like, contains as many of the things that we would want to have changed. And again, Dimi and I are going to talk about it. Um, to give you one last um, indication of or a sense of urgency, um, this is the distribution of responses to um, the EU copyright consultation, which was undertaken in 2013, 2014. And you see that the overwhelming majority of, um, of, of responses comes from users, and a lot of them from what's called institutional users, which was mainly the cultural heritage sector. The cultural heritage sector has in, done an incredibly good job at making their voice heard in this consultation compared to earlier times when copyright was discussed. Um, you see that all of them are, not all of them, but like if you, if you aggregate them, they, they end up, users and libraries and the cultural heritage sector end up on this side that say, yes, we need reform. We need reform on many points. And then you see on the other side, you have the publishers and the artists and the collecting societies who say like, no, keep the status quo. In political terms, keeping a status quo is much easier than changing something because like changing something requires you to build coalitions and keeping something requires you to just sabotage things or like do nothing. Um, so, but, but this is like the best representation of where we have, where like the, the political will is among different stakeholders. And now contrast this to this image, um, which, which looks as it's maybe the best indication of who's currently very active in Brussels. If you look at this, these are the cabinets of the three most important commissioners who are involved in this thing. Oettinger, um, who's responsible about the digital market, Ansip, who's the vice president ahead of him, and Juncker, who's the boss of the commission. And this is the kinds of people, people they are talking to at the moment, or until the end of February. They list like who like their, the highest officials and the commissioners have to list who they talk to. And you can see like that Oettinger is basically talking 50% of his time to rights holders and 3% of his time, and I believe that was um, Jill Cousins from Europeana in that yeah. thing, um, to, to, to users' representatives at all. So this is completely the opposite of what we saw on this public consultation. You see that Vice President Ansip is doing a slightly better job, or he's actually doing a pretty good job of trying to balance like the different bigger sectors of stakeholders. And if you look at the cabinet of, of, of Juncker, he's basically talking to publishers and some other folks. So he's talking to the, to the extreme other end. And in, in, in the total, you see like that this discussion is very much dominated by rights holder representatives at the moment. So this is where the lobby power is. And this is what we need to change. And this is what we're going to discuss after um, this session in the copyright session with Dimi and me. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you.